I was studying, looking at some reports, and I came across this. Number one happiest country to live in in the world. The happiest country to live in in the world also has the highest suicide rate. The happiest country to live in the world also has the highest suicide rate. Finland. Finland is number one. Of 156 countries on the 2019 World's Happiest Re Report, it's followed by Denmark, Norway, Iceland, and the Netherlands, and Switzerland. Watchmarket.com. How about that? How do you make sense of that? And then teens, suicide rates, rising. It's up 33% between 2009 and 2017. And the number of high schoolers complaining, uh, contemplating suicide up 25% in the same time period. And then there's 70% of high schoolers reporting anxiety, depression as a majority, a major problem among the peers. Uh, this is from Forbes magazine, Forbes.com. This is not a religious fear mongering groups. <laughs> no, this is the, the research that shows, right? The happiest country in the world, the highest suicide. And our young people are very aware uh, something's happening inside that's not good. And suicide rates are up. Why is that? Well, you know, when we put our hopes on anything or anyone other than God, the results are definite. There's no 0.0001% of success. No chance. And we live in times where we can get anything and everything we want. And there's all kinds of ways to get a buzz. It might be financial success, business. Business is booming, you know. Um, but if that's where our hope is in, the latest buzz in our hearts of success, but it's not God, it's not the Lord. Disappointment. Disappointment. That's why I think Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. Because a rich man, those of us that have all we want, who needs God? And I've said that before many times. But again, the numbers are, are showing it. We're not making this up. And so for those of us who want to live for God. Those of us who want to really honor him with our lives. And we see people around us getting away with it, so to speak. And everybody's being happy and successful. And some of us who want to follow God are suffering and hurting and lonely. Right? Because fewer and fewer are really wanting to walk with God and look at all the successes and go after those things. And so, how do we deal with this? The Apostle Paul f faced that many, many times in many, many different ways. Just by way of introduction, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle said in verse uh, 16 and following. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and following. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, and there's many ways of decaying, Young people, you don't believe that because you have endless supply of energy. <laughs> and you think that that's the way it's going to be for eternity for you in your physical body. I guarantee you it's not. <laughs> but you begin to experience the decay in every which way. 
But even though the outer man is decaying, yet in our inner man is being renewed day by day. For the momentary light afflictions is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. And here's the deal. Verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Temporary. They're going to turn to dust. But the things which are not seen are eternal. Forever. You see? And it's a matter of perspective. And realizing what the truth is. And when we do not get in touch with the eternal, then we begin to lose perspective. See? And we go after the external, go after the external, go after the external. And when it leaves us empty and dry and lonely and confused and out of. There's nothing worth living for anymore. And sometimes that realization comes 10 years later, 20 years later, 50 years later at our deathbed. When we haven't had the right perspective, you see. And we're come to church to get in touch with what's eternal. Uh, but it's a matter of perspective and priorities. Um, I was interested in what we were singing. Can you put that up, the first verse of one of the songs that we were singing up there? There I was, empty-handed, crying out from the pit of my despair. Empty-handed. I don't know how many people I've talked to that are very, very successful financially, physically. But there is a profound emptiness that's there. And sometimes they admit to it. But most of the time, they rationalize. Ruben, you just want to be negative. Hmm. Okay. Keep going the way you are. The happiest nation in the world. The highest suicide rate. Michael Phelps has been helping, trying to encourage high schoolers. The Olympian most goal, he, I don't think he can... Hang all their medals in his neck and stay straight. He's got so much gold. And yet, he acknowledged his emptiness. Emptiness. You see, when God says something, <laughs> it's true. It's true. There is no other name under heaven by which man may be saved. Jesus Christ. And saved from... The lies of the world and all that is being offered. Jesus. And when I come to die, give me Jesus. But again, it's hard to be thinking in, those, in that way all the time. And so that's why we need to come to church and ask the question. Well, where are you today? Where have you been? Where have I been? Because you see, I'm just like everybody else. I get tempted and I, by the time I know it, all this glittering and all these images, like, oh, and we go after them. And away we go, right? That's the reality. Where are you this morning? Discouraged about where you are in life? What or who have you been living for? Have you turned to God for support and for strength and for perspective? Or are you and I just trying to do it on our own? We've figured it out. We've figured out the market. We've figured out the latest techniques to make money and be successful. We've figured out all the techniques of how to do whatever. And there's all kinds of self-help books, right? All kinds. Just Google it. And they'll give it to you. And we think that's wisdom. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, are you connecting with fellow believers 
who also want to follow God? I mean, really follow God? Or are you just connected with others that also just want to, oh, yeah, the Christian life, yeah, let's have fun, and here we go, everything's positive and wonderful, and yeah, it's great. And no reality. We need fellow believers that are willing to pick up the cross daily and follow Jesus. That's who we need to be connecting with. You see, because the Lord knows that people are blind and naked and poor and miserable. Even though externally they may be doing great. He knows the truth. And God wants you and me to be a part of helping people come to the truth. To come to Jesus. God is wanting you and me to be a part of that. We're not here on earth just to kill time and, you know, have a little paradise here on earth. Oh, my goodness. No, no. That's coming. It's called heaven. But we do not look as what's temporal. We look as what's eternal. See? An eternal weight of glory. But we get blinded, no? We get blinded. And by the time we know it, we're back again. Serving mammoth. Serving the physical, this world. Now, if we decide to live for God. If we decide to, uh, you know what? Yes, I'm going to give myself to Jesus. Um, it's not a day at the beach. <laughs> it, it's, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Why? Because God cannot bless us? No, that's not the point. Because we're entering into darkness to bring people out of darkness. And there's going to be a fight. You see? The enemy doesn't like it. The enemy already owns them. And we're coming in Jesus' name. No. God is at work. And I'm one of his agents. You want to punch me, punch me. But I'm here to serve Jesus Christ. God wants us to be a part of that. He's wanting you because one day we will stop breathing. One day it will be all over. And we're going to be facing him. And what are we going to say? Well, you know, the temptation was very strong. The glitter was blinding. The pleasures were so available. I'm sorry, Jesus. Oh, okay. Hmm. Or will you be able to say, Lord, I turn to you. And you gave me strength. And I lived for you with all I had. Lord, you know I failed. But Lord, I, I lived for you because you are worthy. Will it be that? We're going to be covering 11 verses in Acts chapter 11. And what we find here is that the Lord sovereignly, listen to this, the Lord sovereignly support those who are spreading the gospel. Because when we commit to li living and being part of the team of God, the team that is spreading the word of God, the gospel, and we cry out to him and we trust him. He is going to support us. He is absolutely sovereign. Meaning he is the boss. If he needs a bug to come from China and sting your enemy and kill him, the Lord can do it. See, he is sovereign. And we're going to see some of that little taste of that sovereignty in this passage. In Acts chapter 18. The Lord sovereignly support those who are spreading the gospel. In Acts 11, I mean 18, first four verses, support in Corinth, I call this, support in Corinth. Because the Apostle Paul has committed to serving the Lord Jesus Christ and to share the gospel. But we've known, right, in the previous chapters what's happened to Paul. And... Uh, Supporting Corinth. And then verse 8 through 11, the same experience, right? Rejection and some success. 
That's what he was experiencing in the other towns. Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and all the others, you know. Um, and that's what we find here, verse uh, 5 through 8. But then, 9 and 11, the Lord and his servant, I say. The Lord and his servant. So, let me uh, read the passage. And as we do, I want to uh, point out a couple of things. If you look at your Bible, uh, first of all, uh, let me, as I read, it says, After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. Um, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his house, with all his household. And many of the Christians went, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night, uh, vision by night, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. Again, we need to realize the context, right? The context. What was happening up to this point? So, if you remember, back in chapter 16 and chapter 17, first he came to Philippi, um, and there was beaten, right? Uh, Acts 16, 22 or 24. Acts 16, 22 and 24. And by the way, this is the Christian life. <laughs> Maybe not as intense and, as, and, and as, as suffering as Paul did, but he was the example. So, Acts 16, verse 22 and 24. The crowd arose up together against them, and the chief magistrate tore their robes off them and proceeded to, uh, to order them to be beaten with rods. Well, happy, happy Christian life. Verse 23. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them Securely. All right. Verse 39. Of the same chapter. And after they, you know, after they had all realized, man, this guy, oh, a Roman citizen. Oh, my goodness. They were afraid. And they, but even after that, verse 39, they came and appealed to them. And when they had brought them out, they kept begging them to leave the, leave the city. That was it, Paul's experience. Beat up, thrown in jail, and then thrown out of town. Please leave. How about that reception? Right? That was in Philippi. How about Thessalon Th Thessalonica? <laughs> chapter 18, uh, chapter 17, verse 4. Chapter 17, verse 4. This is now the next city. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, unbelieved, of course, along with a large number of the God fearing Greeks. And a number of the leading women. But the Jews becoming jealous. And taking along some wicked men from the marketplace. Formed a mob. And set the city on an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out to the people. I mean. And they dragged them to the magistrates. And you know. They had to pay money just to be released. Fellow Christians. This was Paul's. Experience in Thessalonica. <laughs> Paul and company had to be let out secretly. In Berea, 
chapter uh, 17, verse 13 and following, uh, Berea was not too far away from Thessalonica. When the Thessalonians found out that Paul was in Berea, go get him. <laughs> they sent out people to go and attack Paul. I mean, that was Paul's experience, right? Verse 13 and following of uh, chapter 17. Uh, let's see. Yeah, 17. Uh, this is now in Berea. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, also they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Thrown out of the city because he was going to probably get beaten up again. And so then he goes to Athens. What happened in Athens? Verse 18 of chapter 17. Verse 18 says this. And also some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers were conver uh, conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this babbler wish to say <laughs> about that? Invitation, that hosting, this babbler. Uh, verse 32 of chapter 17. Now when they heard, because Paul now was explaining, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. Now some believed and so forth. To sneer means to make fun of, to make a joke of, publicly. That was his experience in Athens. Uh, so, how do you think Paul was feeling? And take, listen to this. New believers had come in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea and even in Athens. And he had to leave. He had to leave behind baby Christians. How do you think Paul felt? And in other parts of the Bible we find that Paul was very anxious for them. When he writes to the Thessalonians in Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17 and through 3, he was anxious for them, but he had to leave them behind because he'd gotten beaten up. What was going on inside of Paul? You see? When we put that into context and realize what was happening, now we get a sense of what's happening in chapter 18, 1 and following. God's servant most likely was suffering inside. He was a regular human being like you and me. Beaten up, beaten up, rejected, rejected, and didn't have to leave baby Christians behind? Imagine the discouragement. You see? And sometimes when you and I decide to live the Christian life, it's going to get discouraging. Because not that many people want to follow God anymore. You see? And so now we're going to find that God says, Okay, son, servant of mine. You need to know I'm with you. You need to know that I'm with you. So now we pick it up then, look at some of the details of these verses. Because now we get a better feel of what's happening. Right? So in verse 1... After those things, what things? <laughs> Be sneered at and punished and all the other things before the previous towns. He went to Corinth. Uh, <clears throat> Corinth. Corinth was a lot bigger city than Athens at that time. In fact, it was about 20 times bigger than Athens. Um, probably 200,000 people lived in uh, Corinth. And bigger than, much bigger than Athens. Along with the wealth and luxury, luxuriousness of a a Corinth. I mean, there was a big city. There was a lot of luxury and wealth. There was incredible amount of immorality. Massive amounts of immorality. To be Corinthianized, there was a term back then. Corinthianized means that you were sexually immoral. And so that was a term that was common at that time. Oh, they've been Corinthianized. Sexually immoral, vile. That's what, where Paul went. The goddess Aphrodite. There was a temple there for her. 
right? The goddess of beauty and sensuality and so forth. Uh, the temple had a thousand sacred prostitutes. A thousand sacred prostitutes. <clears throat> and that's where Paul went. In many ways, it was worse than Athens. And that's what we find there in verse 1. So being discouraged, now he goes there. How about that? And then, verse 2, And he found a Jew, a Jew, uh, named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, he, that is Paul, came to them. Now, I want to show you something that um, I hope I can. Here we go. I don't know if it's up there on the screen. Um, is it? Yes. Uh, you may not see, but this is modern-day Turkey, right? And I just want to point out a few things here, just so you know what's happening here. All right? So, over here is Italy. He said that uh, Aquila was, came from Italy, right? Italy was over here. Now, Jerusalem is down here, right? And Paul and, uh, had been commissioned, so to speak, from Antioch, who was over here. And it says that um, Aquila was from Pontus. Pontus was about right up here. Okay, do you see that? I'm hoping that it's... You're able to see that. And now here's Athens, right here in the middle. And Corinth is about right there. That little, tiny little dot right there is Corinth. So, what I want to point out is this. God, God, God had brought Paul way from over here, this way. Uh, Aquila from Pontus, this way, he brought him down here. And both his wife had, and, and, and Aquila had been over here, and he brought them, both of them, here. Hmm. From all these parts, God brought them together. And I want you to note several things here. It says, he was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. It says there, because... Claudius had said, all the Jews get out of town, meaning persecution, right? Why was Paul in Corinth? Persecution. Hmm. Same nationality, same reason for being there. And then it says, verse 3, and he, because he was of the same trade. Huh. The same trade, they did the same thing, tent making or leather working. Same nationality, there because of persecution, they had the same career in terms of trade. Oh my goodness. Um, God, the point is, God was sovereignly bringing them together. And you know, when you say have the same nationality, when you have the same trade, you're suffering the same things. Those things unite people. They encourage one another. Right? Paul was bringing these fellow believers, same nationality, bringing together. Why? Why? To support Paul. To encourage Paul. And God was using these circumstances, in fact, in fact, uh, let me see if I can do this. Um, in verse uh, 2, and he found a Jew named Paquilla, and the native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because, let me see if I do this right. Grant showed me how, so I'm going to trust him. Uh, let's see, because, right here, because Claudius, and then in verse 3, because he was of the same trade. 
The way the Greek phrases it is this way. Because of the same circumstances. Because of the persecution and because of the same trade. In other words, God was using these very circumstances and using that as a reason to unite them. You see, God was at work to support his servant who had committed himself to spreading the gospel. You see. So God sovereignly worked through the circumstances. You see. That's the commitment. Why was Paul committed to that? Because he knew. He knew. That everything, everything, everything in this whole creation. Can never, never fulfill what only God can fulfill. You see. And people are committed to idolatry. To trying to fulfill what only God can fulfill. And Paul was saying, no, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. And he had been persecuted for that, suffered much for it, lonely, alone in Corinth. And God said, no, son, you're committed to following and spreading my word. You need to know that I am sovereign. And I can use all circumstances and I can bring whatever resources I need to bring to support you. And it says there that because they did have the same trade, Paul stayed with them. Come on, brother. Come on. And you can imagine all the conversation that went on between them. I know we were in Italy. And man, we were persecuted. Uh, Claudius, man, he was mean. And all kinds of troubles because of, oh, really? Well, you know, I was in Philippi. Man, you should have seen there. Oh, my goodness, I, I, I got, he's awful. Yeah. Really? Wow. Well, what about Jesus Christ? That's what we're living for. You can imagine the conversation between them. And why again, Paul shows himself again in verse 4 and 5. Look at what he was committed for, right? And he was, and he was reasoning in the synagogue... Every Sabbath trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. That's what he was committed for to. <clears throat> and then verse 5. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia. Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. Solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. In other words. The Jews had been uh, expecting Messiah. And their perspective of Messiah was he's going to be this awesome ruler that's going to do, do away with all the evils and everything. And we Jews are going to be the top of the food chain and we're going to be the greatest and he's going to set it up. But they forgot one thing. They misinterpreted one thing. That Messiah had to suffer and pay for their sins and rise again from the dead. When Jesus came, he gave a whole new perspective, an accurate interpretation of who Messiah was. And that's what Paul was doing all along, correcting that. Jesus is the Christ. And here we go back and forth. Isn't that the same today that people wrestle with? And that's, he was totally, completely committed to that. You see? And... Uh, <clears throat> Well, what do we find there? Because see, Paul's main occupation was spreading the word of God. Now we can have all kinds of careers, but our careers should not be the main occupation of our life. The main occupation should be spreading the word of God, Jesus. We can be a plumber, a doctor, a nurse, whatever you want to be. That's just your career. Your occupation should be the word of God. And there's a lot of wisdom that needs to be learned. We can't shove the Bible down people's throats and be obnoxious. And no, 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 no. It takes a lot of love and wisdom and timing and so forth. And it takes a lot of work to think through and to ask tough questions. How do we do that in a loving way, given our times? But still, our main occupation should be spreading Jesus. And that's what Paul was doing. Totally committed to him. And then... Uh, 
the resistance was there, right? Uh, verse 6, but when they resisted and blasphemed. <laughs> uh, blaspheme can be uh, just saying something bad, ugly, slanderous about somebody. Uh, and it can be that about God. Blaspheming things about God, right? That God is not all powerful or that God caused this and that and it's not true. It's people's own decision, blah, 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 blah. But blaspheme can also be a slanderous uh, saying bad things about a person. And I suspect here that, the, that the, uh, it was both. Saying things about God because, oh, Jesus is the way of salvation. Nah, God doesn't work that way. That's blasphemous. Or it could be that they were talking about uh, against Paul. That they were just mocking him and, and, and ridiculing him. Blaspheming against him. Either way, that's what was happening. They were resisting. No, 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 the truth. The word of God. No, no. And some of us have experienced that over and over and over. And not only that, but then it gets worse. And they're talking bad about us. Or bad about God. And Paul finally had enough of it. He shook his, uh, his garments and said to them, your blood be on your heads. I am clean. From now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. Bye. Sometimes we exaggerate, don't we? We all do. We all do. Okay, I'm going to the Gentiles. He ends up next door. <laughs> That's what happens. <laughs> he goes to a guy, and the guy's house is next to the synagogue. Well, that's a big, long goodbye. Long distance. See, but in his anger, in his, he, ah, I'm gone. And that's what he said. But I want you to know that he was clean in terms of his conscience because, because he had spoken the word of God to them. And you and I can lose so many opportunities to speak the word out of fear, out of whatever, and we end up losing the opportunity. Paul says, nah, my hands are clean. Your blood be on you. I spoke the word of Jesus to you. You, want, you don't want to accept? You want to reject? Está bien. I'm out. But then the Lord says, nah, I need to support you, Paul. You're not going very far. And sure enough, look what it says, verse 7. And he left there and went to a house of a man Named Titus Justice, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. <laughs> You're not going anywhere, Paul. I got my plan. Right? And then on top of that, verse 8, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. How do you think that's going to go over with Paul and all the uh, Corinthians? You think they're just going to stand by like, well, good. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know what? I think Paul was already hearing the whip. I'm going to get whipped for this. Because that's what had happened in all the other towns. That's what had happened every time. And now, right next to the synagogue. All right. Took his shirt off right there. Right there. Go ahead. That's probably what Paul was thinking. I know where this is headed. Now you get the sense why God in the next verse says what he says. You see. Because Paul was probably anticipating being beat up and probably thrown in jail again. Verse 9. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision. When God decides to communicate directly. Something big has happened. That's it. Uh, do not be afraid. My servant. I know where you're at in your heart. I know you have to be a tough warrior. But inside. I know you're very tender. And afraid. You've been whipped for me. You've been persecuted for me. 
And I know you're afraid. I want to let you know. No. Don't be afraid. Any longer. But go on speaking. And do not be silent. But you know what? God does, just doesn't say that. The most, one of the most powerful statements in all of the Bible is this. When God says, I am with you. When I, the Lord of all the universe, am with you. How secure are you going to be? Mm -hmm. Is that not what he tells him in the next verse? Verse 10. For I am with you. In the Old Testament, Joshua, who was Joshua? Joshua was going to take over Moses. And uh, it's a large crowd. And sometimes that large crowd was stiff-necked. And Joshua was going to take over. Or this whole nation. And I want you to know what God tells Joshua. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. Joshua 1 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, and do not tremble or be dismayed, for I, the Lord your God, is with you. You see that? I am with you, Joshua. Turn to Luke chapter 1 in the New Testament. Luke chapter 1. This is when um, Mary is told... Mary is told that uh, she's going to bear a son, and she had not been with her husband. What do you think is going to help her to her socially? Even Joseph wanted to put her away secretly. You're going to be carrying the Son of God. Uh, Luke chapter 1, verse 28. And coming in, uh, coming in, he said to her, this is the angel, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. This is an impossibility. This is, you can't figure it out. But God is with you, Mary. That's what he told Paul. God knew where Paul was. Don't be afraid. Keep speaking. Don't be silent because I, the Lord of all, am with you. Back in chapter uh, Acts uh, 18. For I am with you and no man will attack you in order to harm you. Very important. For I have many people in this city. Hmm. Not only am I with you, I have my people with me. In fact, you already gotten a taste. Aquila, Priscilla, Timothy, Silas, they came also. I've got my people with you. And I'm with you. But I want you to note, he says, No man will attack you in order to harm you. Point. They might attack you verbally. They might even cuss you out. They might even sue you. They might even legally come after you. But no one is going to lay a finger on you anymore. Because I, the Lord God, am with you. How many times have we been thoroughly afraid of what's going to happen to us? You see, we need to get that reassurance. God is with us. God is with us. And especially when we're living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when we get ourselves in trouble, huh, we need the rod on our backs. Right? The Bible says the rod for the back of a fool. But the Apostle Paul was totally committed to the Lord Jesus and to spreading the word of Jesus Christ. And he came to Paul directly to support him and encourage him and tell him what he needed to hear. And what happened? 
in all the other cities where he, you know, he didn't stay long. Because if he stayed long, he'd have stopped breathing because they stoned him to death, they'd whip him, they'd whatever. He, they, he wouldn't stay long. Look at what the next verse says. Verse 11. And he settled there a year and six months. <laughs> right next to the synagogue. Come on, boys. <laughs> They're great. He wasn't afraid. Right next to the synagogue. What? Eating chocolates? Being by a swimming pool? Mm -mm. What does the text say? Teaching the word of God among them. You see. The word of God is living and active. Willing to penetrate the deepest part of our being. Soul and spirit, bone and marrow. Able to surface the intents of the heart. But sometimes we do not know the word of God that way. So we must say, can I commit? I need to commit to the word of God. Because that's the revelation of God. To address the human Heart. The happiest nation in the whole world. The highest suicide rate. How do you address that? We need to know the word of God. So that we can enter with wisdom and love. And revelation from God. And he has given us everything we need. For life. And godliness. See God sovereignly. Support those who are spreading the gospel. Are you committed to that? Or are you committed to what the happiest nation in the world is committed for too? You see? Trying to build this kingdom, trying to build paradise here on earth is a doomed proposition. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 5. Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed means doomed. Guaranteed to fail. Where are you? Where am I? You see, if you've committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, you can get discouraged just like Paul. You can get discouraged. So application number one. 1 Corinthians 15, I mean, second, uh, yeah, 1 Corinthians 15 says this. If you're committed to following God, there's going to be hard times. But let me tell you, if you don't follow God, it's going to be hard times. <laughs> either way, either way, there's no way around it. Why? Because we live in a fallen world. I don't care if you have, if you have a trillion dollars. Nah. Uh-uh, there's going to be troubles. There's going to be troubles. Why not have troubles with hope? Right? So when we're committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Stay steady. Immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil... Your hard work, blood, sweat, and tears with all the frustrations are not in vain in the Lord. It's got meaning now into eternity. Which, by the way, this is one of the things that our young people are suffering with. Meaninglessness. No meaning in life. Why should I study this and that when I'm never in eternity going to use this? And all that they've experienced. And there's meaninglessness. And our young people need to know. There is meaning. There is purpose. When we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And live for him. You see. Don't lose heart. Stay steady. Immovable. Knowing. That it's not in vain. You see. Life has meaning. But there needs to be a commitment. 
to the gospel, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's decision time. Whether you're going to decide to follow Jesus or not, to live for him or not. It is a conscious decision. There is an intention. In other words, it's not like, well, let's see if, uh, you know, by osmosis I get encouraged. And No, 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 no. Decide. Make a decision. Uh, so commitment because living for the Lord is not in vain. Well, on what basis? Because the pastor yelled and screamed? Is that why? No. Uh -uh. You're in trouble if you just look to me, man. I'm just a sinner like everybody else. That's it. But the basis is right there. Second Corinthians, I mean, 1 Corinthians 15. Starting in verse 55. First Corinthians 15, starting in verse 55. Here's, here's the basis on why we can say, I'm going to live for the Lord. Look at that. Verse 55. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Who gave us the victory through Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that great? Because you see. Why do we have cemeteries all over the world? Why do we have cemeteries all over the world? It doesn't matter how educated. How uneducated. How rich. How poor. Black. White. Yellow. Brown. It doesn't matter. There's cemeteries all over the world. Why? Because sin entered the world. And I don't know about you. When we lo but when we lose a loved one. A part of our soul is torn out. And it is horrendous pain. It's a sting in the soul. But praise be to God. We have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see. Those are the bases. On which we move forward. We're steadfast. Living for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not some fantasy, some mythology. No, it's historical reality. Jesus was here and he died and rose again from the dead. Will you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the foundation. There is no other name under heaven by which man may be saved. Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Will you put all your faith in Jesus Christ? If you haven't, I beg you. Stop trusting in your own religiosity. Stop trusting in your own good works. And put all your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again from the dead. And the more you get to know him, the more you realize who he is, the easier it gets to commit to serving the Lord. You see, it's not out of pressure. It's not, uh, I guess now I have to stop drinking. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're missing out on the beauty of Christ. You're missing out on who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And if you don't know him well, listen, it's okay. He will take you right where you're at. If you say, Lord, I don't know much about you, that's okay. You're coming to me with the truth. Man, I'll give you anything and everything. Did you see what I did with my servant, Paul? I brought resources from all over to support my servant. And I used all kinds of circumstances. Even persecution to bring support to my servant. Don't you know that I am the sovereign Lord? And can give you everything you need. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. 
that it's a matter of faith. Will you, by faith, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? We pray you do. We pray you do. Now, we've heard the basis. All right? We've heard what we're committing to, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. What's the prospect? What can we look forward to? Right? Well, it's right there as well. How convenient. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 51. Right there. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we'll all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will, ri will, will be raised, imperishable, and will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. You see that? In other words, what we look forward to is heaven. Where nothing, nothing, nothing can hurt us. Nothing. Forever and ever. Perfection. That's our prospect. That's what we look forward to. But there again, there needs to be a change in perspective, right? Because sometimes we leave, we give our perspective just here on this earth. <laughs> just right here, there's nothing else. Oh no. No. We need to lift our eyes. Lift our eyes to heaven. What God promised. What God promised. You see? But there again, it's an issue of faith. Will you believe in what God said or not? We get blinded, right? We get blinded by the here and now. We get blinded by the problems here and now. We get blinded by the aches and pains of here and now. And that's why we need the word of God. To show us, to bring us like, okay, revelation from God. Did you know that if God hadn't revealed, we'd stay stuck in our blindness. We'd be continue to grope around and, and hit the wall, the brick wall. Ooh, that hurt. Because we're blind. But God gives us, God gives us his word. You see. And we can look forward to what he has for us. Far beyond what we can even ever imagine. The goodness of God. But will you? Will you? Maybe it's time that you talk to God directly. And tell him. Lord I. Actually I'm pretty arrogant God. I didn't think I was arrogant. But man now that I look. like I'm depending on myself. Or God maybe I'm so afraid God. I'm so afraid. I, I, I'm going to make a mistake. Uh, I'm going to make a mistake. And I'm paralyzed. God help me. God help me. Or maybe it's time you tell him, Lord, I, I am stubborn. I'm a stiff neck. And uh, I don't want to give up. I don't want to give up my perspective. I, I have figured it out how I'm going to make life work. And I don't want to change. No. Well, go to God with that too. Go to God with that too. Let me tell you, it's the way of life. It's the way of life. I've said it before. I've told God a number of times. God. Whatever it takes to keep me humble Lord. To keep me humble. If you need to drag me through the coals. God drag me through the coals. Because I know what pride does. My self sufficiency. It leads to destruction Lord. If you need to break me Lord. Break me. I'm yours. That's the way to life. Call on me on the day of trouble. And I will rescue you. And you will serve me. You will worship me. That's the cycle of life. So let my life be the proof. The proof of your love. Let my love look like you. And what you mean.